Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. I'm really pleased to be joined by Jenny Lee Ravello. Hey, Jenny. Hi, Raj. How are you? Great. Great to hear your voice. Jenny's, of course, a senior reporter here at DevX, covers all things global health and WHO, and it is World Health Assembly Week right now. And Jenny's joining us from Geneva, so we're going to dial into all of that. Uh, and we've got a special guest who's back with us, and that's Fatima Sumar. Hi, Fatima. Hi, Raj. Great to be with you. Great to be with you, too. And Fatima is, of course, the executive director at Harvard Center for International Development and has had a long career in both the legislative and the executive branches here in the U.S. On the, in the development world. So really thrilled to get some more time with you this week. Jenny, let's just start with you because I can tell from the background noise, I think you might actually be in the Palais in, in Geneva. Is that right? Tell us what it's like. What, what's it? What's the World Health Assembly like for people who haven't been there? If you're at Palais, there's just, um, everyone's here. All your, the delegates, the CSOs, everyone's just having bilateral meetings, having meetings inside the, you know, the rooms. And then, of course, the official uh, World Health Assembly um, discussions are happening as well. So it's just crazy um, here. But also outside, you know, there's just a, a lot of side events. I guess we're we're guilty of creating more of those ourselves here <laughs> at DevX, right? We've had multiple days of, of events. We have our own summit we do on the sidelines of the World Health Assembly. But maybe we could dive in here because, um, Jenny, you're so close to what's going on there. You cover Geneva. You cover the World Health uh, Organization and all things global health all the time. And this is sort of your Super Bowl week. What What are the big topics? What are the big themes that have come out from this year's World Health Assembly? So for me, I'm really focusing on, I, I've really been tracking and I've been reporting on this, Raj, you know, um, for over two years now, the pandemic treaty and of course the um, processes when it comes to amending the international health regulations. The eye is really on these two processes for this week, but as of the moment, we're still we're, it's still uncertain what's going to happen because they are negotiating at this moment. Yeah, I read your story. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to see it too, Fatima, but it sounds like these negotiations have been dragging on a lot longer than the people who are pushing for this expected and that they're not necessarily coming to a conclusion. And at least my take is the political winds have kind of died down. You know, like when we were closer to the pandemic, there was more interest and impetus to maybe get over some of the disagreements that are at the heart of this uh, pandemic treaty. And now it's probably gotten harder politically, not easier. So, I mean, do you think that there's a real chance this will not even happen at all? Well, there's a con- there's a, that's a real concern for, for a lot of people that if, if this drags on, that the, you know, the political will to get this done would decline. Um, right now, during this week, they are negotiating. and try- I mean, a lot of high-income countries want to get the deal done and in the international health regulations amendments. Um, but they they still have, you know, some holdouts. Like one of them is funding. Developing countries want to create a new fund, want to get some financing. But we've heard, you know, European, the U.S. has been very vocal about um, not supporting uh, a new fund. So now we're going to see by Friday or by Saturday what's going to happen if they're going to agree on something on that. But... On the pandemic negotiations, the discussion now is not about whether we're going to have an agreement this week. It's all about how long are we going to extend the negotiations, whether we're going to see six months from now, which is what the Africa group wants, or one year. So, yeah, that's going to drag on. And I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, elections happening. So, so that will be an interesting thing to follow. Yeah, it seems to me like so many things around global development, that the politics have gotten harder. And you know, we just had here in the U.S. these supplemental bills that passed, $95 billion in aid for Ukraine and Taiwan and other things. And, and included in that were about $9 billion for humanitarian aid. Uh, and that was sort of a down-to-the-wire, you know, unclear if it was going to happen kind of a situation, even with you know, real crisis, especially happening in, in Gaza and in Ukraine uh, as, as the backdrop. The pandemic is now kind of in, way in the rearview mirror, and people seem to have you know, largely forgotten about it. 
and maybe even the politics here in the U.S. and elsewhere has gotten to the point of saying, well, we made a lot of mistakes and maybe, maybe we don't even want to support some of the institutions that uh, were leading us through that period. So it does feel like it's a tougher moment than ever. And all of this is happening in a year when you've got 60 percent of the world voting uh, in elections around the world. You've got you know, high inflation just about everywhere, a cost of living crisis in much of the world, much of the global north in particular. And, you know, it's really tough to imagine that all of these organizations looking for more money, whether it's Gavi and the Global Fund or the World Health Organization, as you reported, Jenny, that everyone's going to end up getting the funding that they, they're hoping to get and maybe deserve to get. I don't know, Fatima, but what, what's kind of your big picture view about this moment, you've worked on the Hill, you've been you know, part of these kinds of conversations. What, what's your sense about the, the moment politically when it comes to support for global development? So, you know, a couple of things I think are happening. Let me pick up on what you said about where we are sitting at the crossroads a little bit in 2024. Um, there are a lot of political currents taking place, certainly here in the United States, but you have elections right now in Mexico, India, so many of the world's largest democracies and smallest democracies. Um, you also have countries where authoritarian rulers are subverting and using democratic systems in order to gain political power. I do, you know, I, I do think we're going to be in a position in a place where we're going to have a huge change of political leadership, probably in lots of different places around the world. And it's going to beget some hard questions that I actually think have been bubbling for quite some time. Um, which is, is this way of funding and going from crisis to crisis, emergency to emergency, humanitarian appeals, seizing the moment of crisis, um, screaming from the rooftops that were underfunded to help the poorest and the most vulnerable, is this really the most sustainable way to get people out of poverty and living thriving lives more long term? Or is the system fundamentally broken? Um, if you look at the reporting Jenny has done and others on the DevX team, and, and even the past week alone, what I'm struck by in all the different coverage of the articles is, is the trend lines you're seeing, which is um, the World Bank, the UN uh, come out with huge appeals, right? In this case, it's for the pandemic fund or the World Health Organization with this new four-year um, call to be more strategic in its funding. The appeals fall short by huge percentages, right? Something like over 50% are unfunded mandates um, from needs of, from the call for proposals from developing country contexts. Um, you only have a handful of donors that tend to be the ones uh, you know, paying heed to the calls. I mean, ODA alone, if you look at official development assistance, it's what you have five, you know, five countries are the 70% of the donors. Where, you know, where are middle income countries in, in that distribution? Where are emerging economies? And where's the private sector? Because if we're going to keep using this formula alone of the richest countries and and hoping that the politics of the richest countries play in our collective favor to, quote, do the right thing, I think we keep ending up in the same vicious cycle in many ways. Um, there's been a lot of talks and conversations, and I know this will certainly be something that comes up in October with the bank fund meetings to kind of rethink this global aid architecture. And, you know, perhaps with all these political changes in the air with this crisis, this political crisis comes development opportunity to think differently about this aid architecture, the roles and responsibilities and how we're going to get this done. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Editor at DevEx. If you are listening to this podcast, you're likely working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But are you subscribed to DevEx Newswire? Global development can be a fast-moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevEx Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality and global health to transforming the food system all in a fun-to-read, free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevEx Newswire and visit devex.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. Yeah, we had an opinion piece in DevEx published this week by Sonia Nishtar, who's, of course, the new head of Gavi and well-known in the global health space. She was most recently a senator in, in Pakistan, where she's from, but she's held many roles at the WHO and elsewhere. And, you know, her piece kind of says, look, 
things are getting really bad in places like Pakistan. I mean, she talks about the floods, you know, the impact of climate, and that we kind of have to get out of this narrow siloed approach and, and kind of really along the lines of what you're talking about, Fatima, like get to something that's a little bit more of a sustainable model. She's focused a lot on the idea of resilience. And I guess I wonder from your perspective, Jenny, you're there, you're covering things like the pandemic fund, which has been struggling to raise, I guess it's a $2 billion round, the next round they're trying to raise by October. And it makes perfect sense when you think back to the pandemic that we would have a fund like this. In fact, it's probably much larger than than $2 billion. And yet it's so tough when the world is in this perpetual crisis and everyone's out looking for funding for their own initiative. Do you feel like there's a sense, Jenny, of, um, I don't know, the global health community fighting against itself, you know, fighting for funding for this one pot of money versus that pot of money? Funny you said that, Raj, because, you know, usually they would say like, you know, we work in partnership, we work together. But at the, thir- at the fourth quarter of this year, you'll see a lot of these fundraising events happening, right? So you have the pandemic fund in October, you have the WHO in the fourth quarter as well. I mean, the World Bank is, is wider, right? But, you know, they'll have that IDA re- replenishment. And then Gavi is just announcing their investment case next month. And we, we haven't seen yet how much Global Fund is going to ask. So, you know, it's funny, like, you know, there's, there's could be a tinge of, you know, truth to that. Like, they're all looking at the same set of donors. Um, there's not much discussion about the role of the private sector. And so... You know, you will see where the money will fall. Right. It almost feels like we need to we need another crisis before you can get the political attention required to actually make some of these investments. Because in the end, the amounts we're talking about seem large versus history, but they're quite small versus the scale of you know the challenges that are being faced. Um, maybe tell us a little bit more, if you would, about the WHO in this, because and of course, they were at the center of the of the uh, virus response, the pandemic response during COVID, and they became a lightning rod in many ways. And now they're trying to change the way that they even get funded. So, like, how were they funded before, Jenny? And like, tell us based on the article you wrote this week how they're looking to be funded in the future. So, the way the ratio has always been funded is is really through um, one. There's flexible uh, funding, but that flexible funding. Uh, which mostly comes from uh, member member states, is really small. So much of the funding, I think around uh, 80%, uh, is in voluntary contributions. But when you think about that, those voluntary contributions are earmarked. So donors have a say as to where that money goes. Uh, so they're trying to change that. They want more flexible funding so they can like put the money where, where the needs are. Um, but yeah... I, it's it's not working. They've tried. They've had uh, you know um, member states were they, they got the member states to agree a few years uh, a couple of years ago to raise their membership dues, but still small, especially when you think about inflation compared to the need that WHO needs. I mean, they're operating around two to three billion a year, right? And so they're launching this investment round. This is, by the way, a story by by Sarah uh, for for this week. But uh, yeah. W- they're, they're quite ambitious um, when you think about uh, $7 billion for four years. They would say it's not much, right? Because if you, if you divide that for four years, it's just how many $2 billion. But like, um, we'll see how, how that goes because this is the first time they're doing it. Yeah, I guess the, the complication, of course, back to the politics of this is how much do donor governments want to support multilateral institutions versus doing their own things bilaterally. It does feel at least like you know, maybe there's a, a new era upon us in which the bilateral donors have no choice but to focus more on humanitarian work. And then they need the multilaterals. You mentioned the World Bank earlier to, to really find ways to leverage the whole world and to leverage the private markets to be able to have the kind of scale needed to address development and health challenges. And maybe that will change people's perspective on the WHO. I don't know, Fatima, what your take is if you saw any of those stories from this week. I did see the stories. And, you know, um, just to, just to step out of the immediate conversation and the negotiations happening in Geneva for a moment, you know, where, where I think, and you said earlier, you know, Raj, maybe we need another crisis. I mean, 
the good or bad news is I think we, we, we have plenty of crises today and will continue to, I suspect, in the coming months and years here. Um, how we leverage within these crisis moments what the real opportunity is for, for moving away from these Band-Aid solutions in development um, and in the public health community, I think, is, is our collective challenge. And what, here, what, what do I mean by that? Um, so sometimes the, fun, sometimes the challenge is where do we get the funds from? You know, what are the donors? Are we going back to the same pots of money all the time, the same, you know, five donors, seven donors? Um, are we really leveraging, you know, the private sector or the foundations or emerging markets. So sometimes it's a question of funding and, and where do we get the funding from? Um, let's say we get the funding or even partial funding. How do we spend the money? Are we spending the money in ways that actually give uh, decentralized power to those on the front lines to actually make decisions in real time in ways that are both cost effective and in ways that don't transfer the risk onto themselves um, from these big global institutions? Um, do we do they actually have local control around decision making power of purse um, that can then lead to better results uh, that we all would then you know champion and support? Or are we earmarking everything up top? Are we um, having such an overly cautious risk approach on how funds are spent that really um, stamp out both innovation, but also create risk aversion downstream for everybody? Do our procurement practices actually um, enable those on the front lines to, to do things that actually make sense for global markets versus uh, favoring a country's agricultural market, like in the U.S., when we talk about food aid, for instance, and U.S. emergency food aid abroad. Um, so, you know, where do you get funding from first? How do you actually spend funds when the funds are earmarked and allocated second? How do we think about results and impact and whether or not we're actually moving the needle when the U.N., um, SDG report that came out in September at our halfway checkup of our progress towards 2030 says we're only 50, less than 15% on track when it comes to outcomes and results of getting us towards zero poverty. So how we actually think about moving the needle and metrics of whether or not we're having impact, you know, we've been really challenged by that as well. Um, and then the fourth piece is the broader political structures that either enable or hinder this broader development space to actually be able to do its job, even when we know how to do it, which I would argue we know a lot of how to do it at this point. We have tons of evidence and knowledge that we have gained and can be quite good at our jobs when these political forces allow us to do them. So, you know, those are the different currents, I think, that I see taking place that we keep kind of rubbing against. And we're going to have to be really strategic, um, both sectorally, you know, whether we're talking in this case this week about some of the public health efforts underway or more longer term as we talk about the global development uh, scenario. And, you know, there is this tension that has always existed between humanitarian aid and the emergency side of crisis relief and broader term, long term economic development um, and inclusive sustainable development at that how we fund those efforts, which get very largely ignored um, because humanitarian crises tend to take over the news, the headlines, and the funding appeals. So those to me are some of the ways that like when I'm seeing the different pieces that are coming out, I want us to always balance the short-term humanitarian crisis, which is of course so imperative to save lives with the longer-term strategies that we have to just be smarter about both as development professionals but also as we understand and navigate the political actors that affect how we do our jobs. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. That's a great framework, Fatima. And, and I think those first two points, that you're really interrelated. Like when you're trying to raise money, it's not incidental how you're going to spend it. And I, I noticed in Sarah Jerving's piece about the WHO request for $11 billion over four years, you know, their WHO, Dr. Tedros, is talking about things like, well, the WHO only spends 35 cents per person on Earth. And they're asking for 11 billion. Well, you know, the globally, the world spent 717 billion on cigarettes per year. So you can look at it in that context and say, well, these amounts of money that we're asking for at WHO are so small that, of course, they should be funded. But I think increasingly, publics and politicians are are saying, but wait, how is that money being spent? It's not just about how much are you asking for, how little is the amount, but but how is it being spent? To your earlier point. And there's a demand for, you know, a return on investment and a case to be made that this is the right way to do it. 
So if you look at 2022, these are this was the highest year of ODA, our official development assistance, which largely funds this development um, budget uh, for the world that we are talking about. Uh, we spent, we were very excited that we hit an all-time high of $211 billion on official development assistance, according to the OECD Development Assistance Committee members. We also had other money flows from, you know, non-DAC donors as well. But let's let's stick to the $211 billion. In that same year in 2022, guess how much the world spent on Apple's 2023 iPhone, just as an example. Those sales, just the iPhone sales came over a little over $200 billion, right, um, in terms of what consumers were spending. So now, look, I'm not saying this is an apples to apples comparison, haha, but, you know, this is just a, another snapshot of how little a drop in the bucket we are actually spending collectively in the world when it comes to the development agenda. Um, and then we are really, you know, fighting for these scraps amongst us to figure out which of our priorities matter more. Jenny, when you listen to this conversation about them uh, is having and I'm having, and you think about what people are talking about at the World Health Assembly this week, does it connect? You know, is there a sense there among the global health leadership that the challenges are getting bigger, but the public support for these institutions and for these issues is waning? Or what's the mood like? I'm going to link it back to the discussion at the, um, uh, at the processes that I've been following, Raj. Remember, developing countries want a new fund. A lot of high-income countries are pushing back. And so, like, you see there's a really, um, uh, you, you see, like, where, where's the money? Like, we're, like, developing countries want more money. But, you know, those, they're looking at the same set of, of, of donors, same set of countries, and these countries are pushing back. And, you know, linking back to what Karima said, like, you know, when you compare how much is going to the sector versus, you know, the needs really, and how much is going to, you know, some of this like iPhones and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> but there's a huge um, demand for money. If you look at my story on the pandemic fund, um, and you look at the second round of proposals for the p pandemic fund, it's about $4.5 billion. But the pandemic fund's second call for proposals was only five hundred million dollars. Yeah, I mean, and the way the pandemic fund works, just for people who don't aren't as familiar with it, is countries make proposals to the fund, right, seeking money for projects that they want to do that will make them, you know, better prepared for things like resilience, uh, surveillance for the next pandemic that might come up. And you're saying that the demand is, you know, ten times bigger than the actual funding that's there. Yeah. And, and, you know, they're, they're just asking now for $2 billion. And, and one of the things I asked them was like, this is still so small compared to the request you're getting. But I guess it's the reality. And I don't know if, like, uh, you know, uh, organizations are trying to be more practical in terms of how much they're going to raise. But, but you see that uh, the demand is huge and, and the funding that organizations are getting isn't much. Yeah, that's right. And, of course... You know, philanthropies, especially the Gates Foundation, have played a really big role in the creation of this architecture in institutions like Gavi and the Global Fund. But at the end of the day, it is the countries that have the scale required. And if, when the countries are reticent, and I'm talking, of course, about the mainly Global North countries, when you look at the politics that we cover so much in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Italy and, and elsewhere, you look at that politics and you say if they're reticent and they're scaling back their funding. It's very tough to see philanthropy or private sector truly filling that gap, especially in this global health architecture. You know, Raj, it makes me wonder. And first, I just want to say the um, the uh, the numbers I cited on, on the Apple phones they came from DevX reporting. So I want to make sure I give credit to DevX for that. Um, you know, it makes me on your broader point, think a lot about how we're going to have to be restructuring the incentives around um, in the development sector, how, how you tie these things back to um, moving away from a charity-based approach of development, which is handouts or things that we do in faraway countries that most of us here, taxpayers, don't understand nor see to investments we're making in a global society that ultimately make us all stronger. Um, and that starts, I think, primarily with job creation, employment, economic growth, 
um, you know, if you have a massive jobs crisis everywhere because you're sick, because you you have COVID or you're suffering from other diseases, um, if you are under conflict and siege and so can't keep a sustainable job, if you don't have education in order to have the skills and training you need to be competitive in, in, in the marketplace, um, you're going to be on the move. You're going to see patterns of migration. You're going to see people kind of trying to leave their home country to go elsewhere. Uh, that places even more political pressure on these very systems as we're seeing here in the United States, but you're also seeing play out in Europe as well. And so, you know, part of this reframing as we think about funding, as we think about needs, as we think about the aid architecture is around this framing of how do we co-invest in a global society in different ways that really benefit all of us and making this case of more direct impact, um, you know, more politically viable. Uh, and it's not just going to be on the, on, you know, the progressive left either. It's going to be, ha it's going to have to be a political um, narrative that actually resonates with voters and political parties across the spectrum. And I think that's something we, we really, we often kind of silo development from politics. You know, we're very, we like to be purists sometimes about this, but that's not our job. Our job is to be the ones designing, implementing, monitoring, evaluating, and ultimately funding new programs. Um, but we all work in this political landscape and, you know, with 60% of the world now um, voting for its new leaders in the coming year, this is a new political global landscape that's being created. And we're going to have to think about how we can also resonate our, our voices and our message resonate in those spaces in, in more innovative ways. Well, we're fast running out of time, but Jenny, maybe as we wrap up, you could give us a sense for those of us who aren't in Geneva, as Fatim and I are not, uh, what's it been like? And in particular, what are some of the things people should look out for from the DevX summit at the World Health Assembly? Um, I know there's a lot of videos out there and pieces we put out from the session. What are some of the highlights in your mind that we should be looking out for? There's a lot, Raj. I think we've, there's a lot of really interesting conversations we've had over, over the last two, two days. And I would really encourage everyone to, to, to watch that. It's, it's online. Everything is online from discussions about the pandemic treaty. We have Dr. Jean Casea. Um, you know, speaking to, to Room B, I spoke to um, the WHO Regional Director of EMRO, with Dr. Hanan Balki, and you know how, how she's navigating all of you know, the conflicts in the region and working through OutBat. There's so many um, really interesting conversations there, and I would encourage everyone to, to watch that. Well, thank you, Jenny, for all the reporting from there and giving us a sense of what it's like to be on the ground. Of course, if you don't uh, yet subscribe. You should subscribe to DevX Checkup. It's our free weekly newsletter that dives into all things global health. And uh, come back and listen next week to This Week in Global Development to get uh, a sense of what all the new headlines are going to be. Uh, Fatima Sumar, Jenny Lee Rivella, so good to be with you both. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you, Raj. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.